Amen. So Job chapter 27, looking at verses 1 to 6, it says, Moreover, Job continued his discourse and said, As God lives, who has taken away my justice, and the Almighty who has made my soul bitter, as long as my breath is in me, and the breath of God is in, in my nostrils, my lips will not speak wickedness, nor my tongue utter deceit. Far be it from me that I should say, you are right. Till I die, I will not put away my integrity from me. My righteousness I hold fast and not let it go. My heart shall not reproach me as long as I live. Okay, so as you probably noticed, uh, have you ever read through the Bible and wondered, and who's writing all this stuff down as we go along? Yeah, like Jesus doing this, that, and there's some guy going, right, right, and all this stuff. Do you ever notice that in the Bible? And you wonder, who is that person? Well, in this chapter of Job, we get a, a glimpse of this. Also in chapter 27, 27, verse 1, and also chapter 29, verse 1, it says, moreover, Job continued his discourse. So there's somebody else who's not mentioned, is not one of the three friends. Somebody else is saying, well, here's all that was happening. And I often find that quite interesting. There's somebody who's writing it all down. Of course, being led by the Holy Spirit. And as you notice there, he calls it a discourse. Now, we've been looking at people having discussions, these three friends of Job and, his, and Job is speaking as well. And they're quite lengthy talks. You never, did you ever notice that uh, when they're talking, they're not constantly being butted in upon one against another, fighting who's going to speak next. They're waiting till the other person has said all he has to say, and then the other person speaks. Very mannerly, aren't they, the way they do it? And so this person is calling it a discourse. Now, what is a discourse? It is basically a speech or a debate in written or spoken format. And that's what these are. And I looked through it and I thought all the way from Job chapter three, what we've had is little discourses, sermons, or poems, or whatever you want to call them, ways of things that, that things are written down for our benefit. And so this person writes down about Job's discourse. And it's, you might not catch this in, the, in verse two. He says, as God lives who has taken away my justice and the almighty who has made my soul bitter. We don't catch that in our English when he says, as God lives, but it's basically what he's doing is swearing by the name of the Lord, swearing by God. And that's, uh, that has to be the ultimate um, last resort when you have to do that, because you know, the Bible does speak against, does the Bible not speak about, do not use the name of the Lord in vain. We've got scriptures in the old Testament, you know, the, um, the Ten Commandments, the third commandment is you shall not blaspheme or take the name of the Lord your God in vain. But that doesn't mean to say you can't use it. It just says don't take it in vain. And some people think, well, you can't use it whatsoever. There are times, and there's a few scriptures there, we don't have to look at them all, but it, there are scriptures in the Old Testament, such as Deuteronomy 6, 13 and 10, 20 and Leviticus 19, verse 12, where it actually says that you are to swear by the name of the Lord. But it's that you shouldn't swear falsely is that what is you're being cautioned against. Don't do that because God will not count him guiltless who takes his name in vain. But when you are stuck in a position where you've got everyone against you and there's no way of proving your innocence as a last resort, you could say, I declare it. I swear in the name of the Lord and God help you if you have uh, told a lie. Okay. But well, we do that all the time, don't we? Or, well, not us, but there are people, and maybe you've done it yourself. Where, have you ever sworn, I swear by God? I swear. Have you ever done it? People do it, don't they? They swear, I swear to God, I didn't do it. I swear to, and they don't realize the, the danger of doing that. But what Job's doing is he's saying, I've no one else to back me up here. If, uh, if I, God has not given me the justice that I desire or what I want, and so I'm appealing to God himself to be my judge and I swear by him, I can swear by no one greater than God. Can you swear by anyone greater than God? No. So he said, I swear to God. And um, here's what he says. And I find it's, I'm going to try and put this into my own paraphrase. Um, he says, as long as my breath is in me, this is my, I swear to God that as long as my breath is in me and the breath of God is in my nostrils, that goes back, of course, to God's creation and God breathing into man's nostrils, the breath of life. My lips will not speak wickedness, nor my tongue utter deceit. Far be it from me that I should say that you're right. Because his friends are trying to convince him that he's in the wrong, that he's done something wrong. He's, he's not righteous in the sight of God. In fact, he's wicked. And he's saying, I, I swear to God, I will never change my mind. I'm never going to agree with you. I am not right. Uh, I'm not wrong with God. I'm in the right with God. 
And he says, far be it for me that I should say, you're right. Till I die, until the day I die, I will not put away my integrity from me. My righteousness, I hold fast and not let it go. My heart shall not reproach me as long as I live. So he's basically saying, as long, by God, I swear to you, by, I will, until I die, I will never give up on what I believe. And I will not change my view. I will not change what I say. I'm going to keep saying the same things. He's not going to speak wickedness, but I'm going to speak that which is right. And he's going to hold fast to his integrity. And I wonder how what, what would it take for us to be shifted from our, our standing or from our integrity? What was it what would it take to blow you off course? Well, Job was a man of integrity from the very beginning, was he not? Go back to uh, Job chapter one and you'll read the opening words by this same commentator in Job chapter one, verse one. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright and one who feared God and shunned evil. That's how he was from the very beginning. But that's all very well. But what happens when troubles come, storms come, trials come? Have you ever had a few things come your way to kind of knock you off course? Maybe change your view a little bit? Maybe. When, it's okay when you're all very well until sickness comes knocking on your door or when, until the enemy comes and trouble starts bashing your door down. Then what are you going to do? Well, we read that after all the disasters that befell Job in the first chapter, in Job chapter 1, verse 20, it says, what did he do? Then Job arose, tore his robe and shaved his head and fell to the ground and worshipped. And he said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now, as I said, some people don't like that. They go, oh, he was definitely um, getting into fear there, wrong confessions and all the rest of it. He, he was doing the wrong thing there. But the verse 22 says, in all this, Job did not sin, nor charge God with wrong. Okay? And he stayed true to what his beliefs were and his integrity through it all. Then chapter two, we, wrote, we saw that in verse three, the Lord says, then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. And wow, what a testimony to have God speak about you. Imagine that, that he said, I know you and I know what you're like and you shun evil and you do what is right. There's none like this one or that one. Okay, now we read. Then, and after all that, and it says, and still he holds fast to his integrity, though you incited me against him to destroy him without cause. That's God saying to him, he has held fast to his integrity. Then in the same chapter, verses 9 and 10, his wife must have picked up on that because we read. Then his wife said to him, do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. Be, be done with it all. But he said to her. You speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God and shall we not accept adversity? And what do we read? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. So now we're what? 27 chapters in. And what is he saying here? Uh, we saw there in verse three, my lips shall not speak wickedness, nor my tongue utter deceit. Far be it from me that I should say you're right. Till I die, I will not put away my integrity from me. My righteousness I hold fast and not let it go. My heart shall not reproach me as long as I live. Do you think that he had a um, had made a stand? He says, I'm not going to change no matter what. Are we like that? How many of you can say, yes, all through the storm as we sing in the songs, I'm going to be standing firm no matter what. I wonder. And of course, we're supposed to learn from Job's experience, as we saw over in James. We looked at this a couple of times. James, chapter, now James was the a brother of the Lord in James, the New Testament book, chapter five, if you can find it, it says this in verses nine to 11. Listen to this, Job, uh, James chapter five, nine to 11. Do not grumble against one another, as if that would happen. Brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. And then verse 11, indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, 
that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. So sometimes we talk about the pa- having the patience of Job, but it's actually the perseverance, the ability. And I, ta- I, I would, ex- I would uh, define perseverance as that when someone presses the right button. Somebody, there was a guy years ago in this church who used to say, I know how to press people's buttons. And he, uh, he did. He could press all the buttons. But if he presses that perseverance button, it keeps you going no matter what, all through the storms and all through the trials and tribulations. Praise God. And that's what Job was experiencing right there. Oh, and that's, like I said, the 27th chapter. Now, in verses 7 to 10, we re- go back to Job chapter 27. Verse 7. He says this. May my enemy be like the wicked. And he who rises up against me like the unrighteous, for what is the hope of the hypocrite? Though he may gain much, if God takes away his life, will God hear his cry? When trouble comes upon him, will he delight himself in the Almighty? Will he always call on God? What Job's doing there is making a comparison between those who are the righteous, those who are the godly, those who are the just. And those who are the wicked, and those who are the sinful, the unjust, there's a difference. And there ought to be a difference between them and us. Are we the righteous? Is there to be a difference between the unrighteous and the righteous? Or are we all pretty much the same no matter what happens? Or are we the standard is different from everybody else? You see, the thing is that the, we have hope. Unlike he says here, what is the hope of the hypocrite? We have hope. But what, is the, what, what hope is there for the unbeliever? Were you at one time one of those people who had no hope? Well, I just want to quote one little verse, uh, maybe two, from Ephesians. And this is Paul describing the, our former way of life and the way so, some people still are. It says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11, Therefore, remember that you, and that's every one of us, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision, by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at that time, is our former way of life, at that time, you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise. Listen to this, having no hope and without God in the world. We don't seem to, seem to realize how dreadful that situation is, but that's the way we were, without hope, no hope. And without God, but just in this world. And then it says in verse 13, wonderful words, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. That was the then and now, isn't it? We are not people without hope anymore, are we? Amen. So, wow, God gives us life and gives us breath. We saw in Job chapter 27 there. Verse 8 says, for what is the hope of the hypocrite, though he may gain much if God takes away his life? Ultimately, it is God who gives breath, gives life. As we saw, Job mentioned this over there a moment ago. We saw in Job chapter um, 121, he said, it is God who gives and it is God who takes away. Isn't that right? Ultimately, it's all in his hands. And this, the hypocrite, there's no hope for him, though he may gain much if God takes it away. Will God hear his cry? What do you think? Will God hear his cry? Well, there may be a few verses that we could bring up on the screen. Because unlike the unbeliever, the believer has someone whom he can call upon. We may want to turn over to, um, let's have a look at Psalm 18. There's a few other Psalms there I want to look at as well. Just real briefly. Psalm chapter 18. And verse uh, 6, it says... world here we go it says in my distress i called upon the lord and cried out to my god he heard my voice from his temple and my cry came before him even to his ears do you know that whenever you cry out to god it's a it's like an obvious promise right there in my distress i called upon the lord i cried out to my god he heard my voice do you know that god actually hears your cry as you're a believer Absolutely. But as for the unrighteous, does he hear their cries? Let's have a look. In the same chapter and in the the, 30, the uh, 41st verse, it says, They cried out, but there was none to save, even to the Lord, but he did not answer them. You know, God's, God's not calling... God's not answering the beck and call of every single person. He's not even call, coming to our beck and call. But it, when we cry out to him, he hears us. 
Amen. I remember a psalm that I learned way back when I first became a believer. It was Psalm 61, which is also there if you're not far away from it. It says, hear my cry, O God, attend unto my prayer from the ends of the earth. Do you, do you know that song, Psalm? No, oh, it's a powerful one. Let's see, have a look at it together. Psalm 61. I we used to sing this song in church years ago. Hear my cry, O God, attend to my prayer. From the ends of the earth, well, I will cry to you. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. And uh, this is also the, the thoughts of um, Job. You know, when he, he was being surrounded by enemies or people who were against him, false witnesses. That's what we saw in chapter 27. But just like uh, there's a, where is it? Psalm, Psalm 27. If I can find it again. Not far away from it. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies and foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war rise against me, in this I will be confident. And this is the sort of thing that Job is saying there in uh, verses seven, he says, may my enemy be like the wicked and he rises up against me like the unrighteous, though they come against my flesh, in other words, for what is the hope of the hypocrite, though he may gain much, if God takes away his life, will God hear his cry? Well, we can say, no, God will not hear his cry. When trouble comes upon him, no, God will not hear his cry. Will he delight himself in the almighty? What do you think? Will this unrighteous person delight himself in the almighty? No. Will he always call upon God? No, and yet we can do the opposite. Look at another psalm. The last one is Psalm 37, because you know the psalms are filled with this type of thing. Psalm 37, and uh, see if this would fit in with what um, Job's thoughts were. He says, do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Amen. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Just exactly the sort of thing that Job needed to say and needed to hear. He will call upon the Lord and delight himself in the Lord Almighty. Amen. And now, in uh, Job chapter 27, verse 11 to 12, it says this, I will teach you about the hand of God. What is with the Almighty, I will not conceal. Surely all of you have seen it. Why then do you behave with complete nonsense? Wow, what an interesting statement. But you know, I believe that when speaking about the hand of God, Job had firsthand experience, didn't he? Now, what do we mean by the hand of the Lord? There are so many scriptures all throughout the Bible that speak about the hand of the Lord, the arm of the Lord, you know, being revealed. And we can sing songs. How many have heard songs or sang songs about the, the arm of the Lord, the hand of the Lord? Or we can talk about being in God's hands, God's hand in our lives, God's hand on our lives, God's hand in the things of our life. Do you feel that you're in God's hands? Amen. I mean, we can talk about all the things Jesus said, and you know, no one can snatch them out of my hand, all of those things. Or we could even talk about the well-known proverb, which is proverb, let me just find it here, proverb chapter 21, verse 1, which says, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord like rivers of water. He turns it wherever he wishes. You know, if God, if God has the king's hand, the authorities, the powers that be, he has their hearts in his hand. What does that tell you? He can turn it whatever way he wants. What is that? It's a teaching there, of course, a very clear teaching, one of the best ones in the whole of the Bible, on the sovereignty of God. Isn't that awesome to think that God says, don't you think that they're just doing their own thing or, or that they're out of control? I have them in my hand. I can do what I want. I can steer them whatever way I want. And if you can do that with the king, how much more can you do with any one of us? Amen. God can do it, right? And so he's he can speak about being a first hand. I can I've experienced God. As for you guys, as for these 
Critics of his, as for his friends, they don't have first-hand experience of God's hand, but they can only speak of traditions of men, what they've picked up, what they've heard others say, opinions. And everyone knows, everyone has an opinion. Isn't that right? But opinions are like belly buttons. We don't necessarily want to see them or hear them, okay? Just know that we know you've got one, okay? Just keep it out to yourself. Now, but Job does say this, I'll teach you about the hand of God. What is with them, Almighty, I will not conceal. Sometimes we conceal some of the things that are in the scriptures. Why do we conceal certain things? Well, people might not like to hear that. There are some churches that will not, and I literally heard them say this one day from a pulpit. We don't use the word hell here because that might put people off. You go, oh, so there's certain passages in the Bible you're not going to read because they might offend people. Yeah, they, there's certain parts of the Bible that are never spoken about. But the Bible says, and this is what Paul spoke about in Acts chapter 20. We're going to have to just look at a couple of verses there. Acts 20 and uh, verses 20 and 27. Easy to remember. Just speaking about how he shared the word of God. And he says in Acts 20 verse 20, he said, uh, how I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house. Don't hold back helpful things that people need to hear the whole counsel of God, don't they? And that's what he says in the 27th verse, for I, shun, I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. In other words, go from the Bible to, through the Bible, from cover to cover. And that's why we like to go through books of the Bible. People might be asking, why are you going through the whole of Job? Well, let's put it like this. There are so many people over the years that all they've done, as, as I've seen, is just picked out a verse. Oh, that's a nice verse. Straight out of its context. doesn't really matter. And just taking it out of Job somewhere or Psalm somewhere or any other place. Not really looking at the context. But what about when you see the whole thing in its context and say, what does it actually say? Maybe that will change our perspective. And we need to see everything in the Word of God. From cover to cover. There's some things that will never be spoken about in some churches because they'll never go to those verses. But when you go through a chapter, you're basically forced to look at every verse. So that's what we do. Now, we don't do it all the time. Sometimes we have a topical message, but this is just going through the whole of the scriptures. And um, I just wanted to say on the last point there, of, uh, verse 12, uh, uh, Job chapter 27, verse 12, surely all of you have seen it. Why then do you behave with complete nonsense? And uh, I remember last week we spoke about, um, in mentions in Job 25, verse 6, about the maggot. How many like that talk about the maggot? Well, in Northern Ireland, and I don't know if it's everywhere else, but if somebody's messing around, see if you, like I was in church one time and I had a bleed, my nose began to bleed. I was sitting beside this guy and my nose just began to bleed. Ever had that happen? Just for no reason? The elder comes walking up comes up to us out of the blue, just appeared out of nowhere and goes, you boys messing? I'm like, no, like, yeah, he punched, he gave me an up and cut in the chair. That's what happened. No, I just began to bleed, that's all. But what we, ha what we, well, there's this expression, have you ever heard the expression, acting the maggot? Oh, so it's here as well. There you go. So when someone says, you guys are acting the maggot, stop acting the maggot, it means messing around. And he says to his friends here, and why then do you uh, behave with complete nonsense? And that seems to be a little bit of a dig at them, his friends. Okay. Now, lastly, this is a, 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 a rundown from verses 13 to 23. Just um, a whole series of what's called imprecations. Uh, we'll explain that in a moment. It says in verse 13, this is the portion of the wicked man with God and the heritage of oppressors received from the Almighty. If his children are multiplied, it is for the sword and his offspring shall not be satisfied with bread. Those who survive him shall be buried in death and their widows shall not weep. Though he heaps up silver like dust and piles up clothing like clay, he may pile it up, but the just will wear it, and the innocent will divide the silver. He builds his house like a moth, like a booth which a watchman makes. The rich man will lie down, but not be gathered up. He opens his eyes, and he is no more. Terrors overtake him like a, f a flood. A tempest steals him away in the night. The east wind carries him away, and he is gone. It sweeps him out of his place. It hurls against him and does not spare. He flees desperately from its power. Men shall clap their hands at him and shall hiss him out of his place. There's a lot in that. 
We're just going to look at it briefly. And the points there are that these are what you call imprecations. You know, there are some Psalms where it says things like, may my enemies be experienced this thing and may dread and disaster come upon them. They're, they're not saying I want to take vengeance on my enemies, but may God deal with my enemies. And so that's the sort of thing that Job is saying here. This is the portion of a wicked man with God and the heritage of oppressors received from the Almighty. And there are a lot of things that are going to be mentioned here, things such as sickness, disease, uh, poverty, death, the sword, you know, all, loss of lots of things. That's the sort of thing that can be expected of the wicked. And so even then it says, um, I'm going to read from this, verse 14, if his children are multiplied, it's for the sword. There's going to come disaster upon them, and his offspring shall not be satisfied with bread. They're going to be in poverty. Those who survive him shall, uh, shall be buried in death. And look, look, look at this, and their widows shall not weep. Now, widows may be plural, as if to say that man, wicked person, ungodly person, may have had more than one wife, or just means plural. Many of these people are going to have widows, and they're not going to weep. What does that mean? Good riddance. Oh, we got rid of, thank God, God he's gone. You know, because the widows are not weeping over, the, over this person at all. And though he heaps up silver like dust, how many would like some dust some silver dust. I know there's some churches base, uh, like to speak about gold dust, but what about this? No, it's just talking about the fact that there's silver. You can gather it up in piles of silver, right? And listen to this, and piles of clothing like clay. Um, I don't know about seeing piles of clothing piled up like clay, but perhaps you've seen the washing pile up after a while. Anyone ever seen that? Yeah, you say, oh boy, the Washington's beginning to pile up here, piling up like clay. He may pile it up, but the just will wear it. In other words, it's going to end up in the charity shop, right? <laughs> I mean, it could be. You walk into some, and I noticed, by the way, when you go to charity shops, it's mostly women's things that you get there. I've never seen really good quality stuff in the, for the, in the men's department. Trousers, stretchy pants, that sort of thing. But what, what not? The women get everything. Shoes, handbags coats dresses the, the whole lot fantastic not that i would be going there of course <laughs> but um they 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 get all that even you can walk in and get some good quality stuff isn't that right and the innocent will divide the silver now listen to verse 18 he builds his house like a moth now if you've got a bible with a little letter beside it you may have a, a different word there how many have got spider instead of moth moths don't build houses did you know that it says here, he builds his house like a moth, like a booth which a watchman makes. Well, the idea there is that it's a fragile house. The way it's probably spider because spiders do build houses, don't they? It's called a web, okay? And moths sometimes visit their houses. They don't usually leave, okay? But the point of the matter is that it's so fragile, like a, a, work sh a, a makeshift uh, shed in a field, that someone has built, it's not very strong. And he says, that's the way his life's gonna be. He builds his house like a moth, like a booth, which a watchman makes. The rich man will lie down, but not be gathered up. He opens his eyes and he is no more. You know, and there's some amazing how some of these translations bring out the, the idea there. Have you ever heard the expression, someday you're gonna wake up dead? Yeah. Wake up dead? How can you wake up dead? Well, that's what he says here. He, he, he lies down and he's no, he opens his eyes and he's no more. Terrors overtake him like a flood. I mean, when you haven't got God in your life and you're not trusting in Christ as your savior, you do not know how to face death properly. And this guy, he has nothing in the end. Flimsy life, a life. And he terrors overtake him like a flood and a tempest steals him away in the night. You could be God in the night. And people say he, he wasn't ready for that. He wasn't prepared for it. The east wind carries him away. This is referring to the hot Sirocco winds that used to blow in off the desert, which would go everywhere and cause great discomfort to people. And it seems to be saying that, you know, there's no way of escaping God when, he, when God is taking away of someone's life. And is God the one who gives life? We know that from Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, God breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life, and it is God who can take it away. And Job said that as well. He says, God gives and God takes away. Naked I came out of the womb, naked I shall return. It sweeps him out of his place. And then verse 22, it hurls against him and does not despair. He flees desperately from its power. There's no way of escaping God's hand or, or death 
when it comes to take you away, especially if God is saying, tonight's your night. Okay? And um, just on that point, there was a one guy in the whole of the Bible that seemed to fit into the description of this person here. And that was, do you remember the story of the rich man and Lazarus? Again, comparing two types of people. There was a rich man. This is in Luke chapter 16. I'm going to turn there real quick. Luke chapter 16, there's a story of a rich man who fared sumptuously every day and everything going for him. Um, so we read verse 19. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abram's bosom. The rich man also died, and that was the end of that. Isn't that right? Is that, was that the end of it? The rich man died and was buried, and that was the end of the story. Well, no, because we read on. And being in torments, in his, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried out, he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may, may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot nor can those from there pass to us. Then he said, oh, 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 I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send uh, him to my father's house, for I have five brothers that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. So he believed that they would repent if somebody would turn up, if a miracle would happen, if only someone would rise from the dead, the great miracle of resurrection, surely then they would believe. That's what we all, you hear people saying it all the time, well, we need more miracles. If we could only have more miracles, with all the Christians could be filled with the Holy Spirit and doing all the miracles, people would believe, would have a great revival. Even if one was to rise from the dead, what would happen? He says, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. What did he say? Abraham says, he said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. Amen. God's hand is on the person's life. And if they are not brought to God, there's nothing's going to bring them. No amount of persuasion or coaxing or coercion will do it. It is the work of the Spirit of God. Amen. And so we have a guy like that. And so just a comparison of the two people. And when he's dead, he's full of terror and torment and worry. Now, the very last verse of Job chapter 27, he says, of that, that person when they're gone, it says, men shall clap their hands at him. Now that, by the way, does not mean they're going, give him a big round of applause. Come on, everybody. A big hand for old Joe there. No, it means not clapping in that sense. Do you know what clapping is in the Bible? It can be seen as an act of derision. And uh, you can see this in verses such as particularly, I mean, we've got here Numbers 24, verse 10, Lamentations 2, 15, and Ezekiel 27, 36. Let's look at just one verse, Lamentations, just after Jeremiah, and one of the major books there in the Bible, Lamentations chapter 2, 15. And it says, all who pass by clap their hands at you. They hiss and shake their heads, the daughter of Jerusalem. Okay, so the whole idea is, it's not respect, it's derision. Clapping the hands and hissing, having a hissy fit maybe, but the point is that they're not very happy with this person and good riddance they're gone. Amen. So the, the point of all of that is, Job has just made this whole big comparison about me and my righteousness, and I'm standing for what I believe in, but as for the wicked and the and the unbeliever, they're going to pass away and they're gone. They have nothing to stand and hold on to in the end. Amen? But what about you? I wonder how many of you can say, I'm going to stand sure and firm all throughout the storms that come my way, because you're going to face them. 
This may, maybe when we were going through Job, you said, well, that's all right for Job, but I mean, I'm not facing that. Well, what happens when you're, would you rather be prepared in advance or would you like to wait till, oh, I better go back and read the book of Job. No, you want to read it in advance so that if ever there's trouble comes your way, and they will, you know, there may be trouble ahead. There could be, there could be all sorts of things coming your way. I don't know when it's going to happen, but you're going to be ready for it because we cannot avoid the temptations, the tests, and the trials of life. But we can certainly be ready for them and be prepared and say, I'll stand. By God, I'll stand. And I'll stand to my very last breath. And that's why Job, you know, one thing about Job that I really find it remarkable about him, people don't give him the credit for what he, what he, who he was and what he had done. He stood firm through everything. He's a man of righteousness. That's what God said. A man of integrity. That's what God said. And even though all these things came against him, he said, I will stand to the very end. I'll be firm in my beliefs. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. Maybe we can close with a song and prayer with people. You know, maybe you're saying, I know I'm going through struggles, I'm going through troubles. Even right now, there's things surrounding me like a cloud of witnesses that rise up against me to destroy my flesh. Thank God that you can be firm and you can know that God will keep you in the midst of this storm. Amen.